Hello, class. Welcome to week three of BMN 507 Bible Overview, Bible Overview with you, uh, summer quarter 2022. Hope you all had a good week. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I appreciate the assignments I've received from you all so far, and uh, I'll be continuing to grade those each week uh, as soon as I can. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me also. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with today. Uh, hope you're all working on your paper or at least have some ideas for what to do. And I do recommend Terrigian guides, but it's not mandatory to do Terrigian guide. You can also do um, Chicago Manual, APA, or MLA, or one of the other guides. Um, basically, I'll give you credit for the content. I don't grade so much on grammar, so don't worry about that. This gives you a chance to practice writing in English and hopefully improve your English skills. And the body of the paper itself is only three to five pages, plus one page for the title, one page for the bibliography. If you have any questions or would like some samples of Terrain Guide, I can send those to you. I don't know your official school policy at this point, so I'm not going to send those um, automatically. But uh, if you do, if you would like to see those, you can uh, request them. Let me know by email and I'll send them to you. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the lecture for today. Um, Okay, so this is BMN 507, lesson three. And we'll start where we left off last week uh, with the origins of the people of God, Genesis 12 through 50. This is still chapter three. Um, and we'll talk about the literary world, the promise and journeys in the ancestry legends. The prehistory has set the scene in Genesis 12, we center in on the lead characters in the subsequent drama. Against this background, Genesis 12, one through three, establishes a new theme, which in some respects will dominate the biblical narrative throughout. That theme is promise. The promise of the Lord first expressed to a Mesopotamian named Abram, whose name is later changed to Abraham, and his wife Sarai, whose name is later changed to Sarah. There is a threefold promise of a land, progeny or descendants, making Abraham a great nation, even though they are an old couple at this point and have no children of their own. Uh, and blessing, which is not only for the nation formed from Abraham, but through this nation to others. So this promise is made, or this promise is the theme throughout the stories of the patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel, and Joseph. So related to this primary theme is a secondary one, journey. The story of the promise is told as a series of journeys, Abraham to Canaan, Jacob to Paddan Aram and back, and Joseph and the rest of the family to Egypt. Later we have Moses to Midian, and back, the tribes of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness and finally into the promised land of Canaan. By describing these materials as the ancestor narratives, rather than using the traditional term patriarchal narratives, um, we recognize the crucial role of women in the stories. While the family system was patriarchal and the inheritance system patrilineal, meaning male-focused, it should be noted that 
Beside each patriarch stands an equally chosen wife without whom the promises cannot be realized. Women in this culture also had a fair amount of independence, taking the initiative in matters that involve uh, their sons and husbands. So we'll start with Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 12, Genesis 12 through 25. Even before the promise is given to Abraham, a tension in its fulfillment is introduced, foreshadowing the major concern of the first ancestral narrative. Sarai is barren, meaning unable to bear children. While we are rarely given access to the thoughts and feelings of the biblical characters, we gain insights into them through their words and deeds. Abraham's actions speak through the absurdity of his leaving his own country and heading off to a new land as a childless man in his 70s. Through his actions, we see that he is a man of faith, willing to, to trust the word of a deity previously unknown to him. He is also materially successful a good host and a mediator among men. He is further portrayed as a military hero, successfully leading a small guerrilla force against an alliance of reigning kings. So he is no crazed wanderer following fantasies, but a skilled, successful, and wise leader. Most of the narrative is devoted to portraying Abraham as a man willing to trust the Lord totally. In Genesis 15, uh, the promise is renewed. Abraham responds in faith and the, the promise is sealed with a covenant ceremony. Though he still has no heir, Abraham trusts the Lord to fulfill the promise. The Lord, whenever again, whenever you see the capitalized Lord, that is referring to God, obviously, and using specifically God's divine personal name, Yahweh, um, which Jewish people came not to pronounce, but use the term, the Hebrew term Adonai for Lord instead. Um, so finally, after years of waiting, a son and heir to the promise is born, namely Isaac. When his faith is tested, Abraham endures. And one of the most awe-inspiring stories in the Bible, Abraham is told by God to sacrifice Isaac with no explanation why. Not until Abraham demonstrates his willingness to take Isaac's life and thus destroy the promise is the boy saved. The story makes perfectly clear that uh, the depth of Abraham's devotion to God. So Abraham does not have to go through with the act of killing his son as a sacrifice, but it's just a test of faith. Um, so the traditions generally portray Abraham as an admirable person. He is an example of faith, an aspect of his character that is celebrated in later Jewish, Christian, and Islamic tradition, all three of those religions. Um, in a sense, come from Abraham uh, and claim him as a key figure in their religion. He also is a model of hospitality when visited by angels and proves to be a generous chieftain when he gives his nephew Lot the choice of range for his herds. Yet his faith wavered when he agreed to Sarah's scheme to get a child by surrogate motherhood using the slave girl, Hagar. And he shows some degree of cruelty when he, uh, when he gives in to Sarah's later insistence to banish Hagar and her child after Sarah gives birth to Isaac.
He further comes across as a scheming rogue when he attempts to pass Sarah off as his sister. Uh, a story is told two times uh, for Abraham himself and one time for his son Isaac. Now, maybe it actually happened three times, or maybe it's just repeated. Uh, uh, so, the first time he um, allows her to enter Pharaoh's harem. And he does this because he is desperate, um, feeling his life was at stake and he would be killed for his beautiful wife. Uh, so he feels desperate, that's why he does that, but it does still betray a lack of faith. So he is by no means a perfect man or perfect character. There, uh, the Bible is more realistic and portraying uh, the downside or the flaws of its characters, um, the characters are more round characters. They're, for the most part, not perfect. Of course, Christians believe Jesus is a per perfect man, but he's the only one. Now, the character of Sarah is also developed in the story. She is a woman who, at age 75, remains beautiful, but rather, rather, uh, rather than relying on her attractiveness, she uses her wits to try to assure that the promise will be fulfilled. In the collection of stories about Abraham and Sarah, we see not flat, lifeless characters, but complex persons with strengths and weaknesses to whom a promise is given, put in jeopardy, and renewed. And I will, now we will turn to the story of Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Rachel in Genesis 25 to 36. In the ancestral narrative, these stories of Isaac, Abraham's son, and Jacob, Isaac's son, and their wives are woven together. Isaac is a transitional figure. He is um, a less dominant figure. He doesn't have as much of a big of, or as big of a role. Uh, Jacob is shown to be a more dominant figure who balances the Abraham narrative and prepares the way for the Joseph story. As in the Abraham story, Isaac's wife is barren, but unlike Sarah, Rebecca does not have to wait years for a son. Twins are born, creating a conflict as to who shall be the principal heir. Because Esau is the first to emerge from, from the womb, he has the right of the firstborn, a double portion of the inheritance, and the office of family head. Yet Rebecca receives an oracle, or we would say a prophecy or a word from God, that the elder shall serve the younger. The friction between the brothers is increased by their opposite natures. Esau is a hairy outdoorsman while Jacob is a smooth-skinned, contemplative boy who likes to stay inside. Esau is a fool, willing to sell his birthright for a bowl of stew, while Jacob is clever, taking advantage of his brother's hunger to buy the birthright. Prompted by his manipulative mother, Jacob exploits his father's age and blindness to steal the blessing intended for Esau. Jacob's journey uh, begins in flight from Esau's wrath, not in faith like that of Abraham. And it takes him to the home of his, the home of his uncle Laban and Paddan Aram, and eventually back again. Ultimately, his journey transforms him. In his initial flight, Jacob has an encounter with the Lord at a place he names Bethel, meaning house of God. There the Lord gives him the promise he made to his father and to Abraham, though Jacob's response is to place a condition on his trust in the Lord. Uh, meaning, if you will be with me and guide me and take care of me, then I will serve you. Uh, that kind of condition. So in his years with Laban, Jacob is tested. 
first the deceiver is himself deceived. And ironically, this also uh, concerns the matter of birthright. Jacob has fallen in love with Laban's younger daughter, Rachel. Um, but after working seven years to earn the right to marry her, he is tricked by Laban into marrying the firstborn, Leah. Uh, given the right of the elder daughter to marry first. Uh, but that's not an excuse for Laban to trick him. That is, uh, he makes that excuse, but he, uh, he still is unethical in the way that he tricked Jacob. Uh, Jacob is persistent and works another seven years to marry Rachel. Polygamy or multiple marriage is common in this culture. That doesn't mean that it is a correct thing to do, but it was common practice. Uh, for we saw that with Abraham and Jacob also. And it also seems to be common to marry within the family um, cousins or even uh, half sister. Later on, there were more strict laws about incest, uh, but at this time, it was common for people to marry within the family or not to, to stray too far away from, from the family, um, at least. So through hard work, Jacob becomes wealthy at his father-in-law's expense as he acquires the stronger portion of Laban's flocks. Uh, the promise of a great nation begins to seem realistic as 12 sons are born to Jacob. So, now the journey starts to be reversed. In a series of scenes that balance the journey away from home, Jacob returns to Canaan. On the way, Rachel demonstrates her cunning by stealing her father's household gods, uh, or idols, we would say, a symbol of family leadership. The unresolved tension in the story is the conflict between Jacob and Esau. As Jacob prepares to meet his brother, hoping that he can win his favor through gifts, the climax in his inner journey is reached. He has another encounter with the divine or with God, and this time in a wrestling match near the Javik River. After an all night struggle, an apparent draw in the fight, uh, Jacob receives the blessing he has demanded, but he is also given a new name, Israel, meaning he who strives with God. And he suffers a lifelong limp after this wrestling match with God. These indicate that Jacob has undergone a transformation. When Jacob meets Esau, it is the fool Esau who takes the initiative in reconciling the hostility between the brothers. Esau's warm reception of Jacob causes Jacob to realize something about the God he has been attempting to manipulate and the nature of the relationship he should have with the deity. After an interlude, the journey of Jacob continues with a return to Bethel, the site of his first encounter with the Lord, now as a man of faith. The structure of Jacob is what uh, might be called an envelope structure or a story within a story. The story of Jacob's relationship with Esau is the frame or envelope for the story of his stay with his uncle Laban. The narrative is woven together around the theme of the journey of Jacob. Jacob's journey balances Abraham's, though they come to faith at different times in the journey. And now we'll turn to Joseph and his brothers in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. From a literary perspective, the Joseph narrative is much more integrated than the earlier ancestral stories. 
Instead of individual incidents woven together, the story is a sustained tale with clear plot development. We are introduced to Joseph as a spoiled, arrogant and foolish 17 year old. Favored by his father, he is naturally despised by his older brothers. When he foolishly tells his brothers of his plan that they will serve him, they hate him all the more and plot to get rid of him. First, they plan to kill him, but instead they sell him into slavery. Then follows an interlude involving Judah, in which Judah is tricked by his daughter-in-law, Tamar, into fulfilling the kinship responsibilities he has been neglecting. Um, I won't go into the details, but she was married to Judah's son, but the son died childless, so she was supposed to be, or she was married to the second son, who also died shortly after and she was eventually supposed to be married to the third son, who was too young at the time, but apparently uh, that never happened, even when the son grew up. And so she tricks um, Judah, her father-in-law, into having sex with her and becomes pregnant so that she does have a son um, that's sort of gross and incestuous, but that was important for women's survival, as well as to have a uh, lasting name for, for those that died uh, before having children. Um, so the, the son born would have been credited to, to uh, the, son, uh, the, the one that died to give him some kind of a line, um, a lineage. All right, so now back to Joseph. Once in Egypt, Joseph is tested. He is tempted by his master's wife and imprisoned unjustly, um, but he remains steadfast throughout. Using his ability to interpret dreams, which he attributes to the power of the Lord, Joseph wins release from prison and quickly rises to power as a high official in Pharaoh's administration. Now the reversal begins. Joseph does not journey home like Jacob. Instead, his family journeys to him. Driven by famine, the brothers are forced to go to Egypt, paralleling the forcing of Joseph into Egypt. Like Joseph, they are tested by being unjustly accused and imprisoned. Unwittingly, they fulfill the dream by bowing to Joseph, but show they are unchanged. Uh, because they claim to be honest men and they're, they're also willing to leave one brother in prison uh, when Joseph imprisons that brother. So once again, they come to Egypt and now Joseph places them in precisely the same situation. The fate of the youngest favored brother, Benjamin, uh, who is Joseph's full brother, the rest are his half brothers, um, is in their hands. After Benjamin is falsely accused of theft, um, but now Judah, who had contrived to sell Joseph and learned his lesson about fulfilling kinship responsibility, takes the initiative. He asks to take Benjamin's place in prison. So with this act of compassion, a resolution is achieved and the journey is completed. Um, as Jacob and his sons are reunited in Egypt, where they settle in the land of Goshen. Genesis ends with the promise to Abraham renewed, but not yet fulfilled. The descendants of Abraham are still few in number and are now living outside the land promised to Abraham. We'll turn now to the historical world, the ancestors in history, finding the original context. The narratives concerning the ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and his family, and Joseph seem more characteristic of ordinary human experience than those encountered in the prehistory. The people who move through the stories are 
recognizably human, and they exhibit consistent character and even signs of growth. So thus readers might get the subjective impression that when we move into the ancestral narratives, we come into the realm of history. Um, but subjective impressions fall far short of historical demonstration without firm data showing the narratives are historical. So again, we're not saying that this, the stories did not happen, but what we are seeing is that we just don't really have uh, clear evidence outside the Bible itself to confirm it, but the um, stories do seem much more, um, they seem much more historical and seem much more likely or seem uh, credible in that situation. We just don't have enough um, data or evidence to prove that they are true um, in that context. They probably don't for many stories going back to uh, this far back in history or in this um, ancient world. But I, I do tend to think that they happened. Uh, now scholars have come to a general consensus concerning the political history of the ancient Near East during the Bronze Age. However, outside the Bible itself, there is no direct evidence that the Israelite patriarchs and matriarchs existed. Archaeological data do seem to illumine the ancestor narratives, particularly in terms of marriage. And certain customs appear in the narratives suggests that they were contained within traditions handed down from an earlier period, such as instances of surrogate motherhood, the practice of leverage marriage of young widows to her brother-in-law, and the allowance of polygamy or multiple marriage. The importance of Rachel's theft of her father's household gods is also illuminated. The images were taken not by the hero, um, Jacob, but by a wife who was seeking to enhance the prosperity of her, um, her family name. Much of our knowledge of family law in the Bronze Age comes from adoption papers in a culture where family ties were supreme and land was closely tied to family and clan membership. Adoption was used by men without male heirs to provide for their old age security and the continuity of family and property. A comparison of this material with the Jacob stories shows many close parallels in the customs. It has even been suggested that Laban adopted Jacob before he had sons of his own. Jacob's departure and Rachel's theft of the household gods would then be connected with the birth and growth to maturity of Laban's natural sons um, with a consequent decline in Jacob's family status. Um, within Laban's family structure. The general location of the ancestors in the environment and culture is also consistent with what is known of the Bronze Age society and are in Mesopotamia and the Levant. It was a feudal and largely agrarian society Documents from various times and places contain references to a people who are called uh, Habiru or Apiru. These words are obviously very similar to the word Hebrew, uh, describing them as outsiders without a place in the social order. The biblical word Hebrew comes from a root meaning to cross over, a likely term for people who came from somewhere else and lacked a proper knowledge of and respect for boundaries. The Israelites used the term to identify themselves to others as outsiders, as they see themselves as strangers and sojourners. The ancestor narratives begin with a, with a migration, but this does not mean the people were pure nomads like 
the Bedouin Arabs of today. When the ancestors moved, it was for an immediate reason to seek water or pasturage for their flocks or to escape famine. Until recently, there was a fairly strong consensus in favor of the dating uh, for the ancestors in the middle of the Bronze Age. Uh, so uh, between the years 2000 and 1500 BC, uh, BCE, this view is now being questioned with increasing frequency. However, there is compelling evidence for dating the Exodus from Egypt in the 13th century BCE, as we'll talk about later. Um, any reconstruction of ancestral history should begin with the most firmly anchored events. So namely, that's the Exodus. Archaeological evidence makes the first centuries of the late Bronze Age, uh, so 1500 to 1200, the most likely chronological setting for the ancestral period, though this is not a certainty. Let's talk about ancestral religion. A careful reader of the ancestor stories notices that alongside the typical names for the deity, Yahweh or Lord and Elohim or God, there are some other names. El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, El Elyon, God Most High, and El Roy, the God of seeing or the God who sees. For example, there are other examples too. These names include the divine name El with various descriptions. Archaeologists or archaeological research has shown that El was the general Semitic name or the father of the gods, and El could be addressed with a variety of descriptions. It may be that the different divine names mentioned reflect ancestral contact with Canaanite religion. Perhaps early Israelites adopted Canaanite mythology to speak of the Lord, um, at least to some extent, or it may be that the ancestors were in fact polytheistic and that references to belief in and worship of one God are anachronistic or reflect a later period. Um, so that means to summarize or to, to put that in another way, maybe the early Israelites believed in multiple gods, but later on as their knowledge of the, uh, God developed and their religion developed and they believed in only one. There's also the concept of uh, belief in several different gods, but one of those is the high God or um, the father of the gods. So, that is the religious background that they came from. And there's evidence in the Bible that, that that's what they believed at least um, earlier in their history. So the most revolutionary factor in ancestral religion may have been not the worship of a single God, a single God but the close ties between the deity of the clan and the ancestor. Rather than being a localized being, the God of Israel journeyed with them and related to them, not through a local sanctuary, but through a covenant. So, conclusion. Taking into account all we have observed, we can conclude that the ancestor stories are authentic folk memories passed down from the Bronze Age, the precise nature of these materials, whether accounts of actual exploits, tribal activities narrated under the name of ancestral heroes or tales that explain origins must be determined by the analysis of each story in question. It is not unreasonable to assume both that some of the ancestors of Israel were remembered in some groups within Israel and that the memories of them were used to advance the Israelites' understanding of the world around them. Okay, that gets us through the end of Genesis. We can turn now to chapter four, Covenant. 
uh, we'll discuss Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is the rest of the Torah or Pentateuch. So in the remaining four books of, of the Pentateuch, the theme of fulfillment of the ancestral promise continues to dominate the narrative. At the beginning of Exodus, the first element of the threefold promise of progeny, land, and blessing, as well on the way to fulfillment. With the deliverance of the people from bondage in Egypt and the subsequent wandering in the Sinai wilderness, attention turns to the second element, the promise of a land. With the covenant at Sinai and the speech of Moses in Deuteronomy, the theme of blessing is central. The theme of covenant is central in these four books. Indeed, covenants are important throughout the Tanakh as, and even the New Testament. Uh, there are two basic types of covenants in the Bible. One is essentially a promise made by God in which a divine plan for a people is revealed. The other is an agreement between parties establishing a relationship in which each takes on obligations. It may be a pact between people or a covenant between God and humans. The most important of this type or covenant of this type is the Sinai or Mosaic covenant, which is at the center of the books to be considered in this chapter. God made a commitment to the people of Israel that is conditional. The Israelites must fulfill the commandments of the covenant if they expect God to remain faithful to them. Both types of covenants recur throughout the Bible. The promissory type is seen again in the Davidic covenant. Um, in which the Lord vows to keep the heirs of King David on the throne of Judah forever. The conditional form is central both to the narrative of the formation and fall of the nations of Israel and Judah in the books of Samuel and Kings and to the prophets of ancient Israel who pronounced judgment based on the people's failure to obey the Sinai covenant. Though the prophets also draw on the promissory covenant when they proclaim a future restoration of the people of Israel and a new age of universal peace and justice. The concept of covenant is also at the heart of the Christian Bible in which the old covenant between God and Israel is contrasted with the new covenant with all humanity believed to have been established through Jesus. From this perspective, the promise, promises um, of God to Abraham and David are fulfilled in Jesus. As are the obligations stipulated in the Sinai covenant fulfilled through faith in Jesus, Jesus Christ. This is symbolized in the Christian community's redesignation of the Tanakh as the Old Testament, meaning Old Covenant. Um, and the remainder of its canon as the New Testament or New Covenant. So in addition to the covenant theme, the books to be discussed in this chapter have a fascinating variety of literary features, and we will examine a representative sampling of them. The role of irony in Exodus 1 through 18, the genre of law codes, and the structuring of the book of Deuteronomy. Before proceeding, it is appropriate to provide further backgrounds for our study of the historical world of the Bible by describing the geography in which biblical history occurred and summarizing the, his the histories of the great empires of the ancient Near and Middle East and of ancient Israel. So let's move to the geography of the ancient Near East and Israel. At its greatest extent, the land of the Bible includes the area from what is now Turkey and the north uh, to Egypt in the south and from Italy in the west to Iran in the east. 
More specifically, the geographic area with which we are concerned is the narrow strip of land at the end of the Mediterranean Sea. The larger area was the arena of the empires of the ancient world, Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman. The smaller area known as Canaan or Israel, or presently known as Palestine, uh, was a land bridge across which these empires passed during military campaigns and trade excursions. To the north and east lay the empires of Mesopotamia. Here at different times, the Babylonians and the Assyrians flourished, exercising dominance over the area. To the south, beyond the Sinai Desert was Egypt, located along the banks of the Nile. Western civilization was born in the Fertile Crescent, the crescent-shaped area from Egypt through Palestine into Mesopotamia. Land called Palestine was known by a variety of names in the ancient world. In some texts, it was called Canaan. In the Bible, it is often the land of Israel. The name Palestine, which means land of the Philistines, was applied to the whole area by the Romans in the second century CE. Although small in size, Palestine has many contrasting features. The land is divided by two north-south mountain ranges that are intersected by east-west valleys, creating four geographic regions. The coastal plain, the central highlands, the Jordan Rift, and the Transjordanian Highlands. The coastal plain along with or along the shore of the Mediterranean is narrow in the north but broadens in the south as the coast swings to the west. Because it is the only valley that cuts across Palestine all the way from the coast to the Jordan Valley, it was heavily traveled and of great strategic importance in ancient times. Between the southern coastal plain and the central highlands is a range of low hills the Shephala. Uh, through this area ran a series of valleys that led towards Jerusalem. Therefore, it was full of important and often fortified cities during the Israelite period. The central highlands are the spine of Palestine, formed by a mountain range that begins with the Lebanon range to the north and continues all the way to the desert, broken completely only by the Jezreel Valley. The northern part of this region is Galilee, with Nazareth located in the southern foothills. The area around Mount Ephraim became known as Samaria. It was fairly populous during the age of the Tanakh and the New Testament period and contained important cities. Further south was Judah, Bounded by steep slopes along east and west, Judah was defensible and relatively isolated. Judah's major road was along the east slope and along this road were the important cities of Hebron, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem. South of Judah lay the Negev, meaning the dry land or the south. Um, this was a wilderness area suitable for dry farming and pastoralism. During the biblical period, Beersheba was the main town and marked the traditional southern boundary of Israel. The Jordan Rift is a huge geological fault between the two mountain ranges. It is a deep depression running from the Lebanon and anti- Lebanon mountains, mountain ranges in the north to the Dead Sea in the south and beyond. It is dominated in the upper half by the Jordan River, which begins in several streams near the foot of the snow peaked Mount Hermon and flows through a swampland into the Sea of Chinnereth, also called the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. Along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, 
laid the important New Testament cities of Capernaum and Tiberias. South of the Sea of Galilee is the Jordan Valley, which in biblical times was full of dense vegetation and predatory animals. The most important cities of the valley were Bethlehem and Jericho. The mountains across the Jordan to the east, the Transjordanian highlands form a plateau. This area was divided into four districts by four streams, Bashan, Gilead, Moab, and Edom. A group of trade routes ran the length of this plateau known as the King's Highway. All right, let's give a quick history of the ancient Near East. The great empires of the ancient Near and Middle East developed in the valleys of the Nile in Egypt, the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, and the Indus in India. And for our purposes, we won't be talking about India, uh, but the other two are important. Uh, these river valleys were all suited to large-scale irrigation agriculture, which led to urban civilization. During the period known as the Bronze Age, which is 3300 to 1200 BCE, great urban cultures arose in each of these valleys. So we'll start with Egypt. The culture along the Nile exhibits one of the longest unbroken strains of ethnic and cultural continuity in the world. From the time of the Old Kingdom to the Muslim conquest of the seventh century CE, Egypt had basically a single civilization. Egypt is sometimes called the gift of the Nile. The habitable land is a narrow strip along the Nile with desert on either side. Egyptian agriculture depended on the annual Nile floods and on irrigation from the river. Egypt was a difficult land to invade, and there were relatively few infusions of new populations. The only successful Bronze Age invasion was by the Hyksos, an Asiatic people whose kingdom lasted from about 1700 to 1550 BCE. The native dynasty that followed forced out the invaders and brought the Egyptian empire to its highest point. The brilliant Thutmose III campaigned northward and extended his dominion to the Euphrates. And under Ramses II, Egypt projected its power far northward only to be blocked by the Hittites. Egyptian influence declined during the first millennium BCE, although the empire remained powerful until the 6th century Persian conquest. Egyptian culture was permeated with an optimism rooted in elaborate hope for the afterlife. There was an extravagant lifestyle for the rich, yet ordinary people seemed to fare well in Egyptian society in most periods. Egyptian religion included a large and generally benevolent pantheon of deities. Early local pantheons were headed by a sun god, later Amun-Re, a combination of two sun gods, uh, the falcon-headed god Horus, the moon god Khonsu, and the sky goddess Nut, Osiris, god of the underworld, and his wife Isis, uh, all became central deities. The pharaoh or king was considered to be the son of Amun and thus himself a god. Pharaohs generally enjoyed great popularity among the people. Let's turn to Mesopotamia. Unlike the Nile floods, the floods of the Tigris and Euphrates were, danger were dangerous and destructive. Mesopotamia was much more open to foreign influences than Egypt. Conquests by warrior aristocrats who installed themselves atop the hierarchy were common. The basic character of Mesopotamian civilization was laid down by Indo-Aryan people, the Sumerians, in the early Bronze Age. They may have been displaced by Semitic peoples, people with similar languages and cultures within the area between African and what is now Iran. 
Mesopotamia was the seat of great empires from late in the third millennium BCE onwards, prior to the sixth century Persian conquests. The major influences on biblical history were the Hittites, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians. The mutual exhaustion caused by the confrontation between the Hittite and Egyptian empires enabled the rise of the nation of Israel. Assyria became the dominant influence in the Near East. From the ninth to seventh centuries. Less durable was the Neo-Babylonian Empire that replaced the Assyrian only to be overcome by the Persians in the sixth century. Persia was not really a Mesopotamian empire because it arose in what is now Iran, but Mesopotamia was the center of Persia's wealth and power. And, Bab um, and Babylon was its center during its dominance in the sixth and fifth centuries. Babylon was also the center of operations of the Macedonian conqueror Alexander um, during our Yes, during the fourth century, the death of Alexander and division of his empire recreated the situation of the pre-Persian world with the Seleucids of Babylonia and Syria in competition with the Ptolemies of Egypt for control of the lands between. The situation continued until Rome moved east and the Roman general Pompey occupied Jerusalem in 63 BCE. Mesopotamian civilizations had more influence on Israel than Egyptian culture did. Um, so like the Israelites, most Mesopotamians were Semites. And during most of, most of biblical history, the empires of Mesopotamia were the dominant power. Like the Egyptian culture, the Mesopotamian was feudal in organization. There was no optimistic hope of an afterlife in Mesopotamia or in Mesopotamian religion. The souls of the dead were thought to go to a disembodied existence in the underworld. Unlike the Egyptian pharaohs, the Mesopotamian kings were not considered divine, but perhaps adopted sons of the chief god or an agent of the gods. Assyria was one of the most militaristic powers in history directing a great deal of energy to the development and use of the technology of war. The Assyrians showed great cruelty to the people they conquered as they decimated societies through exiling the most important people and taking other people as slaves. From the beginnings of biblical history, the lands between Egypt and Mesopotamia were pawns in the power games of these empires. It was only when the great empires were in a temporary downturn early in the Iron Age, about 1100 to 850 BCE, that Israel and its neighbors flourished. Uh, from the Assyrian and Babylonian conquests of Israel and Judah in the eighth and sixth centuries to modern times, with the exception of a brief interlude the land of Israel was under the control of a succession of empires. What made Israel and the other lands so important was their strategic locations on the routes of trade and conquest that were essential to control. We'll turn now to a history of ancient Israel. The history of the people of Israel most likely begins sometime during the second millennium BCE when their ancestors left Mesopotamia and moved to the area we call Palestine. This is called the ancestral period. Sometime between the 14th and 12th centuries, their descendants who had migrated into Egypt were enslaved, later escaped and returned to Palestine through the Sinai desert. This is often called the Mosaic period. Then follows the occupation of the land of Canaan or Palestine. While not all Israelites were descended from the Exodus group led by Moses, it was they who gave emerging Israel its normative 
Origin traditions during the 12th and 11th centuries, the tribes of various origins that made up the people of Israel were apparently loosely organized, joined together by kinship cl uh, claims and by a commonly held allegiance to their covenant with God. In the period of the judges, charismatic leaders known as judges emerged to head coalitions of tribes against common enemies. In the 11th and 10th centuries, the tribes gradually organized themselves into a state level society with a centralized bureaucracy under a king. Uh, first Saul, then David, and, and then Solomon were the first kings. Uh, this is the period of the United Kingdom, a period called the Divided Kingdom, followed with a division of the land into two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. The Divided Kingdom continued until Israel was conquered by the army of Assyria by 722 BCE, and Judah was dominated by the Babylonians. Uh, by 589 to 587 BCE. Then followed the Babylonian exile. When the Judean king and many other, the, many other leaders were forced to live in exile in Babylon. When the Persians replaced the Babylonians, there was a return of some leaders to Palestine beginning the Persian period. The Babylonian exile began a phase of Jewish history called the diaspora or dispersion in which Jews established communities outside Palestine. The Persian period continued from about 539 to 333 BCE when the Macedonian conqueror Alexander the Great gained control of Palestine. And this began the Hellenistic meaning Greek phase Alexander's successors, the Egyptian Ptolemies and the Mesopotamian Seleucids, eventually took control of Palestine. And the vicious uh, uh, repression of the Seleucids sparked a revolt among Jews, headed by a family called the Hasmonians, also known as the Maccabees. Their victory led to the creation of an independent Jewish state in the second century BCE that lasted until the Romans took over in 63 BCE. Rome continued to maintain control over Palestine and the Mediterranean world. All of the New Testament was written within the environment of the Roman period. During a Jewish revolt in 70 CE, Jerusalem was leveled by the Romans uh, decades, this was decades after the death of Jesus and the missionary activity of Paul. And during the development of the Christian church and the period of writing of the New Testament, there existed relative toleration interspersed with periods of persecution of Christians by Roman authorities. The period of the 70s is usually called the Apostolic Age, and the following period that continued until the middle of the second century is called the post-apostolic age of Christian history. Okay, we'll move back. That's our just over overview of the history of Israel uh, through both the Old and New Testament times. We'll get now into the book of Exodus. Let my people go, Exodus 1 through 18 with the literary world and we're asking Pharaoh a God, kind of an ironic question as we'll see. Uh, the narrative in Exodus one through 18 tells the story of the enslavement of Jacob's descendants in Egypt by a Pharaoh who was unfamiliar with Joseph. Uh, the birth, early career and commissioning of Moses by God who reveals for the first time to the characters in the story, the special name Yahweh or Lord, the confrontation of Moses and his brother Aaron with Pharaoh and demand to let God's people go, the 10 plagues, 
visited on the stubborn Pharaoh and his people and the miraculous deliverance of the fleeing Hebrews from Pharaoh at the Red Sea. The story gives us an opportunity to observe the role of irony in a biblical tale, especially in the portrayal of Pharaoh, whose attempts to oppress the people of Israel and keep them from escaping are thwarted at every turn. Despite Pharaoh laying heavy burdens on the people, the people multiply more. And Pharaoh's plot to kill the sons of the Hebrews is outsmarted or disobeyed uh, by the Hebrew midwives, refused to kill the Hebrew boys. Uh, Pharaoh is then victimized by the series of plagues sent by God that climaxes with the death of Egyptian children, uh, including his own son. Pharaoh and his best warriors are finally humiliated by the collection of Hebrew slaves. When we remember that Pharaoh was accorded divine status in Egypt or considered to be a god, the ironic portrayal takes on deeper significance, namely the deflation of the claim of divinity of the Egyptian king. Mighty Pharaoh is powerless in comparison with the true divine warrior and king, uh, God, Yahweh, uh, then he, Pharaoh is becoming, or essentially becomes little more than a helpless pawn in the drama. Irony in Exodus 1 through 18 also includes Moses. His first decisive act of leadership of his people is killing an Egyptian who is beating a Hebrew um, is immediately undermined by suspicions, suspicions of his motives by other Hebrews, which foreshadows the recurrent motif in the narrative of the people complaining about the leadership of Moses. So these are a few examples of the rich irony pervading the literature and that serve uh, to enlighten the literature with humor, surprise, and mystery. From a literary perspective, the Lord is a character, not only in the Exodus narrative, but also throughout the Bible. In these chapters, we are introduced to one of the most pervasive characterizations of the Lord in the Tanakh, God as divine warrior without equal. Let's turn to the historical world, the Exodus in history. Literary historians agree that the Song of the Sea, which is Exodus um, 15, is one of the oldest texts in the Bible, in the Bible because of the archaic character of the poem's language and style. It seems very old. In addition, the song seems to draw on the structure and imagery of the Canaanite myth of the god Baal, who destroys the chaotic forces uh, personified as the uh, god Sea or Yam or Yam um, in order to reestablish cosmic order after it has been disrupted. In Exodus 15, the Lord shatters Pharaoh's army with the imagery of chaotic waters being overcome. Feminist interpreters have pointed out that in the Canaanite myth, the goddess Anat is Baal's fellow combatant, and imagery associated with her is also applied to the Lord in the Song of the, Song of the Sea. So collapsing the god and goddess of the Canaanite myth into the single character of the Lord. So there is only the god in the Hebrew story. There's not a god and goddess, uh, only one god. Adaptation of Canaanite mythology is found in a number of other books in the Hebrew Bible, also relating the exploits of Baal and Anat to the Lord's involvement in historical events especially the exodus from Egypt. 
Israelite folk memory recalled the Exodus and the manifestation of the Lord at Mount Sinai as a single complex of events that became shorter of Israel's national existence and the reference point for understanding the meaning of Israel's life and its relationship with God. While some literary historians have argued that not all groups in Israel shared this full complex of traditions, at this stage we need only observe that the group that experienced the Exodus became the bearer of Israel's national traditions, which became the common property of all those who came to think of themselves as Israelites. Looking beneath the stylized aspects of the narrative concerning the Exodus, a plausible sequence of events can be seen. Perhaps abetted by natural misfortunes. Uh, maybe there are explanations from nature for the plagues the Bible records, uh, but aided by these, if so, a group of Hebrew slaves, one released from their imperial master, led by their advocate Moses, a Hebrew with knowledge of Egyptian ways, they began their journey northeast out of Egypt. A contingent of Egyptian frontier guard, guards pursued the escapees. At a crucial moment, the Hebrews escaped through a body of water um, that was shallowed by the wind. The Egyptian chariots pursued for the kill, but the wind changed. The tidal flow shifted and the chariots were overcome by the resurgent flood and they drowned in the water. All discussions of the Exodus must recognize that the Topography of the Suez Sinai has been modified by the digging of the Suez Canal. Several candidates have been advanced as the possible location of the Exodus. Uh, so we don't know for sure, but a few possibilities include the uh, Lake Timsa, uh, the Great Bitter Lake, Lake Minzala, and Lake Sirbonis. If we could pinpoint the location of the sacred mountain, the location of the Exodus might be easier. But for the ancient Israelites, the mountain of God was movable. Uh, when Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, the holy mountain moved from the wilderness to Jerusalem and Israelite folk memory is vague on Mount Sinai's original location. So they focused more eventually on Mount Zion than on Mount Sinai. And there was not a definite memory of where Mount Sinai exactly was. All right. Uh, so while most interpreters are inclined to accept the traditional location for, of Mount Sinai as being Jabal Musa or a more modest peak near Kadesh Barnea, others point toward a location in Midian, south of Edom. We must admit that a plausible case can be made for the northern, central, or southern Exodus routes, and the biblical accounts with the stages of Israel's journey squared with one of the identifications of Sinai. Um, the southern location on the Gulf of Suez may have the most historical probability. There still seems to be, or still seems to be a fairly strong consensus among knowledgeable, and knowledgeable historians as to the date of the Exodus, although it is not as widely held as it once was. It rests on reasoning out the most probable conclusion from both biblical uh, tradition and archeology span while some scholars want to assign the Israelite descent into Egypt in the Hyksos period as the most likely time for an Asiatic, such as Joseph, to rise in the service of Pharaoh, foreigners were important or were in important governmental positions 
at other periods also. Others associate the Pharaoh who was unfamiliar with Joseph later on, uh, or the Exodus itself with the expulsion of the Hyksos. But the Hyksos episode is only one example of the sort of upheavals that could bring new people to prominence or cast down others in radical changes of government and policy in middle to late Bronze Age Egypt. Amenhotep IV, also known as Akhenaten, who lived from 1364 to 1346, or who reigned from that time, uh, presided over a great cultural revolution in Egypt. Uh, discovery of the palace archives at Tel El Armana have revealed correspondence from supposed vassal kings in Canaan, which portray a region in turmoil. These were, or there were numerous instances of revolution and intrigue, and many could rise and fall in such times. In contrast, the biblical narratives require a time for the Exodus when there was extensive or were extensive building activities in the Nile Delta where the Israelites were supposed to have been. They also require that the Egyptian court be located nearby because Moses and Aaron seemed to travel easily back and forth between the Hebrew labor, the Hebrew labor camps and Pharaoh's court. The early 13th century BCE meets this requirement because during the 19th dynasty, there was an, an infrastructure for imperial campaigns in Asia, headquartered in the Delta region, in, 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 in an inscription dated to about 1208 BCE, the ruler Mernipta claimed to have inflicted grief on Israel, um, recognizing Israel as an established presence in Canaan at this time. So that would be the um, a definite a date that's definitely later than the Exodus. The biblical traditions say that Moses led the Exodus group to uh, in the wilderness for 40 years, the conventional Hebrew figure for a generation. Then he yielded to Joshua, who led the second generation of the Exodus company across the Jordan, Jordan, Jordan River into the land of Canaan. Clear-cut destruction layers dating to the mid to late 13th century have been found at some of the towns said to have been captured by Joshua. The rebuilding of the sites tended to be cruder and more modest, and new villages sprang up in previously unpopulated areas. So this suggests that a different, culturally less sophisticated group was responsible for the destruction and the new villages. According to the account in Exodus 13, Moses avoided the more direct and heavily traveled coastal route to Canaan, for at the Egyptian end, it would have been well supplied with checkpoints and fortifications, and further along, there would have been the chance of encountering Egyptian Hittite opposition and fights due to the early incursion of the Sea Peoples, including the Philistines, uh, who traditionally were enemies of Israel. These data constitute a strong case for an early 13th century BCE date for the Exodus. Though some argue for locating the Exodus a century or two earlier, no alternative hypothesis has been or has such a large body of data in its favor. It has further been noted that the Exodus story would resonate with a broad range of people in the region over an extended period of time, as many groups experienced oppression under the pharaohs of the 18th through 20th dynasties 
as the Egyptian armies marched to the north, taking war prisoners and other slaves and deportees who were brought to Egypt. Moses, the central character, would have been a mediating figure as a Semite with an Egyptian name, married to a Midianite woman and associated with the landless tribe of Levi. Such considerations suggest how such traditions could become a central focus for the diverse people who came to constitute historic Israel. All right. So you shall be my people and I shall be your God. We'll look at this covenant, uh, the literary world covenant and law, which covers Exodus to be 19 to 40. Uh, 50 is a mistake, that should say 40. And also Leviticus and Numbers. And we'll start with the Sinai Covenant. As the people camp near the mountain, Moses ascends and encounters the Lord. He is told to remind the people how the Lord delivered them from the Egyptians and brought them to this place, and then say that Israel will be God's special people if they obey the covenant. This is the heart of what became known as the Sinai Covenant. It is a conditional agreement dependent on allegiance to the Lord and faithfulness to the covenant. The Sinai Covenant introduces the way to fulfillment of the third element of the ancestral promise, blessing. Through obedience to this covenant, the descendants of Abraham will be blessed, and through them, others will be blessed. In the final form of the Pentateuch, the demands of the Sinai Covenant continue with one narrative interruption in which the covenant is broken and restored afterward. Uh, so it continues from Exodus 20 through the entire book of Leviticus and until Numbers 10. Let's look at the types of laws. To analyze the, the legislation from a literary point of view, let us first focus on the form of particular laws. There are two basic types of laws in the Sinai legislation. In, in the Sinai legislation, one is an unconditional command or prohibition called absolute or apodictic law. It is legislation. The other basic form is conditional law called case or casuistic law. It is common law. The first type of law describes categories of actions to do or avoid in order to maintain the type of social order God, um, God desires. The second type identifies specific situations that can threaten social harmony, and it identifies what to do or not to do in these situations in order to maintain or restore balance. The specific law is often elaborated when given, um, either to make it more specific or to provide a motive for obeying it. Frequently, the motive is based on assumptions about who God is and what God has done. Other motives appeal to general principles of respect for human life and the minimal conditions of living. Let's look at law codes. Individual laws are combined in the Pentateuch as legal collections or codes with their own particular orientations. Grouped together in the Sinai setting, they are given equal authority as stipulations of the covenant, regardless of when they may have been composed. Uh, so some scholars think that some were composed much later or a bit later, but uh, joined to those earlier. Uh, so most basic is the ethical Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, which appears first in Exodus 21 through 17. Its fundamental significance is underlined by its being placed first and by its repetition in Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 21. And these 10 epidictic laws are found the essence of what it meant for ancient Israel to keep the covenant. 
The 10 laws are divided into four that establish the parameters of the people's relationship with the Lord and six that set forth the boundaries of human relationships. The first appearance of the Decalogue is followed by a collection of mostly casuistic laws known as the Covenant Code or Book of the Covenant. These laws seem to make more specifics, uh, makes more specific some of the Ten Commandments. For example, Exodus 20, 23 through 26 specifies in what ways the Lord is to be worshipped if there are to be no graven images. And 21, 15 to 17 indicate what should happen to those who do not respect their parents. After the, the covenant code is given, a ceremony is held to seal the covenant. The blood of a sacrificial animal is thrown by Moses on the altar and the people, and Moses reads the book of the covenant to them. Another early code, usually called the ritual decalogue, is found in Exodus 34, 10 through 26. Except for the ritual decalogue, uh, the next collection of law or continues with one narrative interruption from Exodus 25 to Numbers 10. Because of the dominant concern with matters of worship and the priesthood, this lengthy corpus has been called by interpreters the priestly code. However, there is much variety within the material. For example, Leviticus 17 to 27 includes a collection of laws that revises the covenant code, concerns the, uh, the holiness of the people, uh, and concerns the holiness of the people, called, it's called the holiness code. Many Literary historians set apart Leviticus 17 through 26 as distinct from the rest of the book of, Levit of, Levitic of Leviticus and consider it a separate law code for several reasons. First, its views of holiness, which means being set apart from God, um, contrast with other chapters by focusing on the land rather than the sanctuary as the context for holiness. In addition, in these chapters, all the residents in the land are admonished to be holy, while the remainder of Leviticus links holiness to priests and Nazarites devoted to the service of the Lord. However, other scholars question whether Leviticus 17 through 26 should be considered a separate literary unit. Uh, they point out that this section of Leviticus is considered thematically with the preceding chapters. The themes addressed in the Holiness Code include the slaughtering of animals, sexual relations, ritual and moral holiness, penalties for the violations of the mandate for holiness, the holiness of priests, holy offerings, appointed festivals, the ritual lamp, bread, and punishments for speaking contemptuously of God, a sabbatical year of rest for the land, and the year of Jubilee, cancellation of debts and freedom of indentured servants every 50 years, and rewards for obedience and penalties for disobedience. When Moses ascends the mountain again after the ratification ceremony, he receives an elaborate set of instructions on the building of an ark, which is a container for the tablets of the covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was also considered a symbolic throne for the Lord. Uh, and they may have actually believed that or um, God may have actually sat on that throne, um, his presence being literal manifest um, among his people. In addition, an elaborate lampstand, an altar table, and a tabernacle to house them are, are mandated with uh, instructions for the priests who will conduct worship there. The 
The other major collection of law in the Tanakh is delivered by Moses as part of his speech in Deuteronomy 12 through 26 and is called the Deuteronomic Code. Now we turn to the historical world, law in the ancient Near East. Common understanding concerning rules of behavior, notions of how to deal with rule breakers and techniques for solving tensions caused by extreme forms of misbehavior, especially murder, are characteristic of almost all human social groups. Such systems have often been administered by family heads, tribal notables, a shaman or other cultic figure, or a special sort of arbitrator. The formal codification of law and the development of legal institutions and means for enforcing law and order accompany the emergence of social stratification and governmental organization. Law codes are some of the earliest documents to survive from the ancient Near East. The code of the famous early Babylonian Emperor Hammurabi, uh, from 1728 to 1686 BCE, was the first to come to the attention of modern scholars and remains the best known. Uh, though it was actually preceded by other Mesopotamian law codes. In addition to law codes, contracts, deeds, and records of lawsuits have or survived. Various parts of the Tanakh preserve a similar variety of legal documents and practices. Our literary analysis has shown that several major codes are embodied in the Torah, all of which seem to be compilation of material that grew up over a period of time. In addition to legal material, they also contain religious rubrics, medical and public health protocols, rules for maintaining ritual purity, obscure taboos, and many other items. Law was administered by are in pre-monarchic times, or pre-monarchic Israel by tribal elders, village elders, or both, and by specialists whose particular skills or special charisma were widely recognized. As Israelite culture became more organized, important cultic centers and the gate courts of fortified towns became the sitting places of priestly and lay courts respectively. In addition to the monotheism of the Israelite Torah tradition and its inclusion of relatively rare absolute law, its persistent commitment to egalitarianism is also notable, uh, meaning it's more of a sense of equality among groups of people. This can be explained by its roots in the relatively egalitarian tribal culture of the pre-monarchic period. Okay, now we return to a look back, a look ahead. We'll talk about the book of Deuteronomy and we'll look at the literary world the farewell address of Moses. Throughout history, many great leaders have given farewell addresses in which they sum up what has happened during their term of service, give advice for the future, and symbolically pass the mantle of leadership to a successor. In its final literary form, the first 30 chapters of Deuteronomy are structured as the farewell speech of Moses to the people of Israel as they stand ready to cross over the Jordan, over the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. Enter the, enter the land of Canaan. Uh, this speech includes the three elements of historical review, advice for the future, and concern for succession. 
There are numerous theories concerning the literary structure behind the speech format. It is possible to consider most of Deuteronomy as a reflection and updating of much of the book of Exodus. In addition, similarities um, have been noted between the structure of Deuteronomy and the form of a treaty between a dominant nation and its vassal states called the Suzerainty Treaty, which was common in the ancient Near East from about 1500 to 700 BCE. The principal nation agrees to protect the vessel provided the conditions of the treaty are met. Deuteronomy can be interpreted as an adaptation of this form um, of the covenant between the suzerain or sovereign lord and the vassal Israel. Elements of the treaty which show commonality to, to other such treaties include a preamble and historic prologue. Uh, general principles, detailed obligations, curses and blessings, and provisions for deposit and public reading. Because the Lord is the only God, according to Deuteronomy, there can be no other divine witnesses. So this common element of a suzerain treaty is not present. The language of Deuteronomy is noticeably different from any we have so far encountered. It has the ceremonial style, um, style encountered today in many sermons and political speeches. Some suggest it has framed um, or was framed in the rhetorical prose of Judah's professional scribes of the eighth to seventh century BCE. While all of the Israelite traditions tend to be egalitarian, and humanitarian in outlook, Deuteronomy is especially so. While the covenant code of Exodus ordered freedom for male but not female Hebrew slaves after seven years, Deuteronomy extends the rule to female slaves and requires the owner to provide an endowment to give the former slaves a start in life. It also established a welfare system and prescribed a uh, limited monarchy that placed the monarch under the, law, under the law, equal justice for all, including foreigners, is a given. Right. Now we turn to the historical world, the law book in the temple. According to 2 Kings 22, in the 18th year of King Josiah of Judah, Hilkiah, the chief priest, found the book of the law in the temple during repairs and gave it to the royal secretary. The king was distressed upon hearing it read, knowing that he and his people were potentially in a great deal of trouble since neither they nor their immediate ancestors had observed its teachings. Hulda the prophetess confirmed that the scroll was authentic and that Judah was doomed for disobeying its teaching, though this doom would come only after Josiah's death. Josiah responded by launching an extensive and uh, radical religious reformation. All sacrificial worship was centralized in the Jerusalem temple and are from which every trace of pagan Religious, uh, religious influence was purged. Since the early 19th century, scholars have debated whether the book of the law found in the temple was the book of Deuteronomy or a portion of it. The reasons still considered compelling are that the major interests of Deuteronomy, which are centralization of worship, the removal of pagan elements from the temple and the incorporation um, of the provincial priesthood in the central shrine were the key elements of Josiah's reform. 
Archaeology has now shown evidence of something like Josiah's reform, such as the construction of a wall through the middle of the nave of the shrine at Irad to, present, to prevent worship there. Josiah, like his great-grandfather Hezekiah, was dedicated to restoring the independent Davidic kingdom from Dan to Beersheba throughout the entire land of Israel. Uh, it is not surprising that both kings were religious reformers as well as political and re religious revitalization frequently go together. But unfortunately, the Deuteronomic uh, reform failed after Josiah's death. And we know that um, the nation eventually was defeated and went into exile. Okay. Uh, now I've given you a primary text today, and that is uh, the Ten Commandments from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. You can see them here, or you can look it up at BibleGateway.com. Type in, Genesis, um, type in Exodus 20, 1 through 17. We'll read through those Ten Commandments. Hopefully you're somewhat familiar with them. If not, this is a good chance to learn about them. Now for assignment two for this week, uh, ask you the same basic questions every week for the assignment. One is, did you watch the lecture video? And two, what is the main idea that you took from this week's lecture? So this is what you have to do to get attendance, complete this and email it to me. If you want to get some extra credit, then read the Exodus um, 21 through 17, the Ten Commandments passage and answer the following questions. Summarize the Ten Commandments in your own words. What made this covenant central for Israel? Are covenants necessary for societies and human groups to function effectively? That's just a yes or no question. And then which of the covenants or agreements that affects you, uh, that currently affects your life, we all have these. Uh, which of these is most important in your life? You have reasons for your answers. You might want to think about laws of the land um, or other types of covenants, family relations, or could even be your um, your phone contract. Uh, so hopefully it's not your phone contract, but just in case you're thinking about the kind of covenants that are part of your life. So. Again, this is only if you want extra credits. If you're happy with just the attendance, um, then you only have to do the first part. But if you want some more points, you can do the second part as well. I just wanted to always, I always want to give you a taste of the actual text of the Bible. So I'm going to give you a primary reading each week from the Bible. So please submit your assignment to me by email. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And hope you all have a great week. Take care.